thank you for coming. Welcome to today's Compass Lecture. So, uh, when we consider the extent to, to which scientific curiosity can drive uh, an inspired individual, it is truly astounding to, to see the progression of results of his work and pursuits. So, in the case of Professor Jeff Marcy, his pressing curiosity, his need to know whether, there, whether or not there is life outside Earth, and the search for extrasolar planets has led to results that we may consider otherworldly. Um, Jeff Marcy's scientific curiosity uh, began since the age of 14, while experiencing the cosmos through the eyes of his telescope. His fascination in astronomy and physics led him to UCLA, where he received his BA in 1976 in both physics and astronomy. In 1982, he received his PhD at UC Santa Cruz in astronomy and astrophysics and held a number of prestigious positions at, Car at uh, Carnegie Institute of Washington and San Francisco State for becoming a professor of astronomy here at Berkeley uh, since 1999. Uh, so his research requires the use of the Earth's uh, largest telescopes and our largest space telescope, uh, Kepler. Um, he states some of the best parts of his research are working alongside his collaborators, and his friends and colleagues, and sharing his research. So truly, his, he gives us the knowledge that his work has revealed. We owe him thanks for these essential contributions to science that we can now pass on in our history and astronomy books, the name that will be remembered a few times. So here to tell us more about his work, uh, it is my pleasure to present to you the discoverer of over 200 extrasolar planets, uh, cello and tennis player, <laughs> Professor Jeff Marcy. It's really nice of you to ask me to be here, and um, uh, I'm, I'm feeling particularly lucky because I have some new results to tell you from a new telescope. So I'll tell you, introduce you to the new telescope and try to give you some of the early results that haven't even been uh, publicly made available. Um, uh, and I have a feeling that there's a diverse audience here. Some of you may be physics majors, uh, some of you uh, astronomy majors, but some of you might not be. Uh, you know, a physics or astronomy major. So I'll try to bring you all along for the ride. Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, introduce the topic uh, with just a couple of words. Um, some of you know that my research group has worked for 15 years to discover uh, extrasolar planets, sometimes called exoplanets, planets that orbit other stars. And this being a, it is a special time because 15 years ago, we didn't know of any planets around any stars. It's amazing that with all the science fiction novels and movies, 15 years ago we knew of absolutely zero planets orbiting other stars. In other words, we didn't know whether our solar system was a common uh, phenomenon in the universe or a rarity. We didn't know whether Jupiter was common. We didn't know whether the Earth was common. Since then, uh, our group and another group in Switzerland with various groups here and there, a little bit at Harvard, a uh, little bit at Texas, we have been finding lots of planets, but the largest ones, by a technique I'll show you, the largest planets, the more massive planets, are easier to find, the Jupiters, the Saturns, even the Neptune-sized planets are fairly now easy to detect around uh, nearby stars, uh, using a Doppler shift measurements that I'll show you real quickly. Um, but what has been missing? is the discovery of Earth-sized planets. Still to this day, there are no known, no discovered planets the diameter of or the mass of our own Earth. So we don't know whether Earth-sized planets, uh, you might go a step farther, Earth-like planets, are common or rare. And there are reasons to think they might be common. Small planets perhaps are easier to manufacture in the cosmos. Uh, but on the other hand, small planets are vulnerable to gravitational perturbations, gravitational slingshotting by more massive planets. So Earth-sized planets, you might think naively, should be common, and our own Earth is just one of billions, but they, the Earth-like planets might also be uh, in, in some trouble. So we're designing um, a new experiment, and we've more or less finished it, to detect Earth-sized planets. And here's the technique. When an Earth-sized planet happens by luck to cross in front of its host star, the star dims. 
All you have to do is measure the brightness of another star, and you can sense the presence of another Earth, and moreover, measure the radius of that Earth. Because, of course, the larger the radius of the planet, the more light is blocked on its way to us. And so you can measure, determine directly from the fractional dimming of light, 1%, a tenth of 1%, a hundredth of 1%, from that fractional dimming, you can determine the pi r squared of the planet relative to pi r squared of the star. And that's the basic technique by which we are now trying to find Earth-sized planets for the first time. Uh, it's a daunting challenge. Here's a, a, a geometrically accurate rendering of our sun and then, um, of course, our Earth is shown here in the center. Uh, and you can see the relative size. Our Earth uh, blocks about one part in 10,000 of the sunlight. That is to say, pi r squared of the Earth divided by pi r squared of the sun is 10 to the minus 4. So you have to measure the brightness of another star to a precision better than four significant digits in order to securely detect Earths uh, that would dim those stars. And so this is, in fact, the challenge, this, this relatively tiny dimming uh, that's required. You, sort of, you need precision, as you can see, at least three times better than this part in 10 to the 4. So we're doing that with a space-borne telescope. And uh, NASA uh, worked with us uh, scientists to design a telescope specifically to achieve that photometric stability and precision. And about a year and a half ago, we launched it on a Delta II rocket from Cape Kennedy. Uh, and it was a, a monumental achievement. Let me just give a 20-second backdrop. It took about 10 years to design the telescope uh, the shroud, the, the control system, the optics, the camera, the CCDs, uh, and then arrange to have it launched on a rocket from Cape Kennedy in Florida. And I'm going to cut out of my PowerPoint presentation because we worked for so many years to get to this launch date that we were very nervous, worried that the rocket might uh, go up from Florida and uh, go down in the Atlantic. So there were about a hundred of us who ventured to Florida, to, Cape, uh, to, the, to the Cape, to watch the launch. And I want to show you now something that you might never have seen. This is home video of the launch. We were standing on the beach. These people were standing next to me. And I'm now going to uh, play for you the home video. I mean, you can see the official NASA video online. But here's home video to give you a feeling for what it was like to be there during the launch.
So this is a little less than half the diameter of the Hubble, one meter diameter mirror. What's amazing is the wide, there's a corrector lens that gives you a wide field of view, 10 by 10 degrees, and then a 95 megapixel CCD at the bottom. And so that, it's that, uh, the wide field of view that makes it special. Because of that, when Kepler takes an image near the galactic plane, 150,000 stars are recorded. Uh, digitally, minute after minute, indeed every minute we take another picture. While I've been talking during this lecture, Kepler has taken 10 pictures. Uh, and it does so in the Cygnus constellation, and it will do so for three and a half years. Uh, just taking picture after picture of the constellation Cygnus. And it is achieving uh, a precision of about 0.002% every single star being measured to that precision. So it's a, it's a glorious um, uh, telescope. Here it is in, at Ball Aerospace in Boulder, Colorado. And I'll just mention, those of you who are physics majors or engineering majors perhaps, one great way to make a living is uh, not necessarily to be a, a scientist per se, but to work for one of the uh, engineering contracting firms that build the telescopes and build the detectors. And so uh, Ball Aerospace is one of those companies where you can contribute to the, the increase of knowledge of, of uh, humanity by working at this, this place and, uh, and helping build this wonderful telescope. Here's a person working on the electronics and the optics uh, on that telescope. And there's the suite of CCDs. You can see uh, uh, some 42 CCDs there. And here's the spectral energy um, response in nanometers, so this is the blue through the red. And you can see that Kepler has a uh, sensitivity throughout the visible optical range. So it's a marvelous wide field, um, all wavelength camera. And all that Kepler does is stare at this patch of the sky. It looks small, but this is actually 10 degrees by 10 degrees. The moon, the full moon, is a half a degree across. So you're seeing a patch of the sky, 20 full moons by 20 full moons, monitored every minute, minute after minute, and has been doing so for a year and a half, and will continue to do that minute after minute for two more years, <coughs> with the only goal, a very simple goal that even a kindergartner can understand, of looking for stars that dim. They should dim not only once, but again when the planet orbits across the star, and then again and again, so there's a predictability. A hallmark of science being if you think you found something spectacular, you better be able to reproduce your results. And here's a case where Kepler watches for the dimming. If Kepler detects a second dimming, you can now make a prediction when the third dimming should occur, and it better occur or else it wasn't a planet. And so we can make those predictions and verify the, the planets that we find. It's, it's a marvelous uh, science experiment. Let me show you some real data. This is a graph uh, for one of the stars, Kepler-4, uh, and you're seeing the brightness of the star. Here's 1.0000. It's a relative brightness, and here's 0.999. So the noise you see up here at the very top, that noise is actually only about a part in 10,000. And then every once in a while, you see the star dims. Right there, right there, if I get my laser pointer to work. It's not, not always worked. Oh, here, I know. I, I have to tap it. Whoa. Uh, there's a dimming, there's a dimming, there's a dimming, there's a dimming, there's a dimming. Like clockwork, every three plus days, the star dims. It better be like clockwork because, of course, the planets obey Newton's laws of physics, and so they, it, the orbits ought to be repeatable. And so this is a marvelous example. You could uh, comb your hair with these data. Spectacular repeatability. <laughs> Um, this constitutes what we call a planet candidate, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, is it a real planet that's causing the repeated dimming, or could there be another phenomenon that causes it? And the big nemesis that I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about is the possibility that the star, Kepler-4, has a background binary star fainter than Kepler-4 that eclipses two stars that orbit each other, eclipsing each other, diluted by the light of the foreground star, Kepler-4, and that background eclipsing binary, every time the two stars cross in front of each other, would cause a dimming. Maybe we're fooling ourselves, and this isn't a planet at all. 
but in background eclipsing binary uh, system, star. So that's the, that's the issue that I'm going to address. Before I get to that, let me show you these data phase folded. You take every dimming and you simply uh, plot it on top of each other. And you can then immediately see this nice, beautiful curve. The data points are shown. The solid line is the computer model. You simply build a model on the computer of a star with a planet that orbits, crosses in front of the star, and then emerges. And that model yields the solid line. Why does it uh, slope in slowly? Well, because the planet has some size itself. It encroaches into the edge or limb of the star. It takes about a half an hour for the full planet's uh, size to fully be engulfed, if you will, by the star. And then there's a phenomenon called limb darkening, where the surface of the star's brightness is not uniform. It's brightest in the center. So when the planet gets there, it's blocking the most light. Then the limb darkening uh, causes the planet to block less light. And then the planet emerges from the star. So this solid line is a beautiful and, frankly, essentially geometrical model. And you can see how well the data are fit by that model, lending a lot of credibility to the pro prospect that it really is a planet. And if it is, you can immediately calculate from this 10 to the minus 3 dimming that the planet has pi r squared a thousandth of that of the star. Knowing the star's properties very well, uh, that allows you to calculate the diameter of the planet. And it's 4.1 times the diameter of the Earth. So this is a planet, supposedly, 4.1 times that of the Earth in size. But is it real? And one of the keys in science that often you will not hear about, you, uh, those of you who are undergraduates, you might occasionally go to a seminar in, in uh, physics or astronomy, and you'll hear the, the speaker describe the results. But often they won't talk about how they might be wrong. And I'd like to specifically tell you how we might go wrong and how we circumvent that and double check to find out if we are wrong. So is it a transiting planet? And if it is, we really would like to know the mass of the planet and the density. Because the density of the planet tells us whether it's solid, liquid, or gas. So that's the basic idea. But now let's go back. Is this a real planet? Well, the way we check that is by watching for the prediction. If there's really a planet there, then the planet should yank gravitationally on the host star. The star and the planet should orbit a common center of mass, and we should be able to measure the Doppler shift of the star's light and see that Doppler shift changing periodically as the star comes at us and away from us. And the idea, of course, is something like this. Here's the star wobbling due to an unseen planet yanking on it gravitationally. The, the star gets jerked around the common center of mass. And you simply see the wavelengths of light Doppler shift to shorter and longer wavelengths, uh, allowing us to verify that there really is a planet. If the star Kepler-4 doesn't do this little dance, something's wrong. So we went to the Keck telescope in Hawaii. And you may or may not know the Keck telescopes in Hawaii are located on the big island high atop a uh, hopefully dormant volcano called Mauna Kea. <laughs> and there is not only one of the world's largest telescopes, 10 meters, a tenth of a football field across, but there's also a wonderful spectrometer that allows us to spread the white light from the star uh, into all of its composite wavelengths of light. So the focus of the telescope is up here. This is where you would normally put an eyepiece. Of course, with a professional telescope, we have no eyepiece. We just let the light that converge to this point now diverge and go on into a spectrometer. And the spectrometer consists of a parabolic mirror, a diffraction grating, a prism to separate the spectral orders, and then a big camera that brings the spectrum of colors to a focus. And we, of course, have a CCD, uh, so the same detectors that you have at the back of a digital camera, to collect that spectrum of colors. Here's what it looks like at the telescope when you sit there running the telescope. And by the way, we run the Keck telescope and the spectrometer that's on Mauna Kea, on the summit, from here at Berkeley. We sit in Campbell Hall in the basement we have a remote observing facility, real-time audio-visual dedicated uh, lines to the summit where we talk to the technicians. We run the telescope, the spectrometer, and everything from here at Berkeley. We work all night long. 
come at 5 p.m., we go and get dinner, uh, bring dinner in, and then we just stay in Campbell Hall next door all night long until about 8 a.m., uh, collecting spectra like this one. Now, this is a spectrum of one star uh, taken at one instant of time, but if this star actually has a planet, the Doppler shift should be visible. And so when you come back a week later or a month later, you should see the spectrum Doppler shifted. Something like this. There's a Doppler shift. If you come back yet more time later, you should see another Doppler shift. And yet again, another Doppler shift. Now, of course, if the planet is orbiting the star, the planet will turn the corner and yank on the star in the other direction. So we should see the Doppler shift go backwards and so on. We should be able to see this periodicity over and over again as the planet orbits the star, yanking on it gravitationally. That's all fine, but I've lied. And the way I've lied is I forgot to tell you conveniently that an Earth-sized planet will actually Doppler shift the spectrum by no more than about one ten thousandth of one pixel. So I've greatly exaggerated the amount of the Doppler effect. And the way we get around this very serious technical problem, how do you measure Doppler shifts of less than one pixel, never mind a 10,000th of a pixel? The way we do it is we zoom in on specific absorption lines, these spectral dark lines. We zoom in. Here's one of the dark absorption lines. And over the course of time, we watch that spectral line cover up neighboring pixels. And here you see the amount of light in the neighboring pixels. If the spectral line moves by even a ten thousandth of a pixel, a little less light will go in one pixel and a little more light in a neighboring pixel. All you have to do is measure the amount of light in the neighboring pixels and thereby determine the center of mass, if you will, the centroid of the spectral line. So in principle, you can measure the position of a spectral line, in other words, the Doppler shift of the spectral line, to arbitrarily high precision if you collect enough photons in each of those pixels. So that's the basic idea. Um, and now let me show you what happened with Kepler 4. Remind you, Kepler 4 has apparently a planet that takes 3.2 days to go around the star. And it, now we want to check, is the planet real? If there's really a planet there, we should be able to measure the Doppler shift of the star's light and see the 3.2 day periodicity in the Doppler shift. So here's what we found. This is from the Keck telescope in Hawaii. The Doppler shift in meters per second, I should have put the units, meters per second, so here's five meters a second, 10 meters a second, 15. We can literally measure the speed of a star to plus or minus one meter per second, human running speed. You can, you can walk a meter per second. There's, a, there's about a meter per second. So we actually can measure the speeds of stars from the Doppler effect to plus or minus human walking speed over the course of time. And you can see right away with your eye, the star did wobble, the velocity varied sinusoidally, indicating the planet is in, indeed there. It's in a circular orbit. The star responded gravitationally just as predicted if the planet were really there. This rules out the eclipsing binary uh, concern. So the possibility of an eclipsing binary in the background mimicking a planet is ruled out because you see the Doppler shift as it must be. Um, the, so period, the period looks a little bit long, a little bit longer than the 3.2 days. Yeah, it really does. I, I noticed that too. Let's just see. Here's this. Uh, there's 2. Point, let's see if you're right. 2.3, uh, something like, yeah, you know, um, let me think here. I, you know what it is, Charlie? I've mislabeled the x-axis. Here's a big tick mark. That should be 1. This should be 2. And I think this should be 3. I've mislabeled the x-axis. I'll tell you what I did. You're absolutely right. And I saw that too, and I thought, what? Now I'm glad you mentioned it. In PowerPoint, I, I, I like to make my graphs visible to the back of the room. I put in these numbers, and I did not properly label the tick marks. So that's exactly what happened. But it is, in fact, a 3.2 day period. You're absolutely right. So the planet is con confirmed, of course, from the amount of wobble of the star, the velocity variation, you immediately use Newton's laws of physics and you get the mass of the planet. The more mass of the planet, 
the larger the wobble of the star in just a second. And the mass turns out to be 20 Earth masses. So that's very, very well and good. We now know the mass and the diameter of the planet, so we know that we can calculate the density of the planet. And the density comes out to be 1.9 grams per cubic centimeter, which is a remarkable density. The Earth, you may or may not know, has a density of 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. And water, as we all learned in high school, has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter. So this is a planet with a density intermediate between that of water and that of our Earth, five and a half. And the most reasonable uh, estimate of the composition of this planet Kepler-4 is that indeed it's composed both of rock and water. And so the best models have an iron nickel core, a silicate mantle, not unlike the Earth's uh, mantle, and then a large water envelope around it, and perhaps hydrogen and helium. And the best models must reproduce this observed density and the mass of the planet. And there are now research papers out that indeed reproduce the uh, interior structure with the, the, the iron, nickel, the silicate, the water, and the hydrogen and helium, all from this, from this density. Professor Marcy? Yeah, oh, sorry. If, if we had an eclipsing binary, wouldn't that also give a Doppler shift in the, in the brighter star? It, it would be so faint that it wouldn't make an effect, but moreover, you'll, you'll like this. Suppose there were a binary star in the background that had a period of 3.2 days. Those two stars, gravitationally bound to each other, would be whipping around each other at several hundred kilometers per second, not a few meters per second. Just so because of the mass. We would, because of their mass, it's not a planet going around a star, but it's two stars going around each other. So you'd have hundreds of kilometers a second, and that would, uh, you know, we would see wild swings in the Doppler shift, or indeed none at all because the binary is too faint. So this is a flavor, and indeed one of the most exciting results from Kepler so far, a flavor of the power of measuring the diameters and the masses of planets. You get the first hints of the interior structure of planets. This is amazing. And remember, keep in mind, we have not received a single photon from this planet. We haven't seen the light from the planet reflected, thermal or otherwise, and yet from the dimming and the Doppler wobble, we get a good picture of the density and hence interior. So there's real progress being made that touches on uh, the geophysics and the chemistry. But now, moreover, there's, a, another, there's another conclusion you might draw. This is an obvious planet. You can see the dimming with your own eye. And so you might ask, if finding a planet four times the size of the Earth is that easy, how hard would it be to detect a truly Earth-sized planet? Clearly, an Earth-sized planet would make a, a less, less dimming, but Kepler ought to be able to do it. So you can see right away that these 150,000 stars that Kepler is observing <coughs> offer the clear capability of detecting planets of one Earth radius, planets the same size as the Earth. Now, um, this leads me to uh, the next level of this talk, which is, well, how many Earth-like planets might there be in our Milky Way galaxy? And you can do an estimate. Our Milky Way galaxy contains something like 200 billion stars. We're not sure yet whether Earth-sized planets are common or rare, but we have two early estimates. And I'd like to tell you something that's not publicly known. Um, we have been observing stars with the Keck telescope in Hawaii to detect small Earth-sized planets, and we have found quite a few of them. Uh, we've been observing 166 GK-type stars, sun-like stars. Uh, they sit on the famous Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, this may or may not mean much to you, in this domain, which are sun-like stars. This is bright luminosity and essentially color or temperature on the horizontal axis. Um, so in that domain, we're watching these sun-like stars. We've used a catalog of stars, uh, selecting the nearest ones within 25 parsecs, fairly bright. This means chromospherically inactive, magnetically inactive stars, all in the solar neighborhood. So with this sample of 166 sunlight stars, we watched for planets, and we have discovered quite a few. 
working for the last four years. And here's one of them. You see velocity of the star over the course of, well, orbital phase, one full orbit here. And you can see the wobble of the star. Yes, it's noisy, but it's understandable because this is only four times the mass of the Earth, 4.15 times the mass of the Earth. And so we are beginning to find planets that are just a little more massive than our Earth. Here are four of them, clear periodicities. Out of the 166 stars, we found quite a few Earth-sized planets are a little bigger than the Earth. And here's the final census. This is a histogram with planet mass on the horizontal axis and the uh, fraction of stars that has that mass on the vertical axis, the fraction of stars, the percentage of stars that have that mass. You can see out here the Jupiters, only 1.6% of the stars have a Jupiter, smaller Jupiters. Saturn's, again, roughly 1.6%. Neptune's mass planets of 10 to 30 Earth masses, 6.5% of the stars had one of them. And for the planets between 3 and 10 Earth masses, we found that 11.8% of the stars had one of those very small planets. We were not able, with our Doppler measurements, to get right down to one Earth mass. As I told you, we still haven't found Earth mass planets. They're just beyond our technical reach. But they're very close. As you can see, the 3 to 10 Earth mass planets are showing up. And what's dramatic about this result, which, by the way, we announced only last week. So this was published in Science uh, uh, with uh, a really nice paper that my postdoc, Andrew Howard, was the lead author on. And you can see this rise towards smaller and smaller masses. We didn't know this. Nature makes more small planets than it does the big planets. And if you were to be so um, cavalier as to extrapolate all the way to the Earth-sized planets, well, then you might anticipate more Earth-sized planets than these that are somewhat larger. What's so, the total number of these small ones you found? There's about uh, 10 or 12 uh -huh. in this in this bin. So the Poisson errors are sort of, you know, 20% or something, 20 to 30%. So this is an exciting result. It's, it needs more work, but it's, the, it's a first. We, you've never seen a plot like this before. And so we're beginning to get the first census and anticipation of how many Earths there are. Now, Kepler is doing the same thing. And I want to show you a plot that you cannot take a picture of because it's not public knowledge. The Kepler telescope has not announced these results. I'm a member of the team, so I'm showing you private results. Remember, Kepler measures not masses of planets, but the radii, the diameters of the planets. So this is the same kind of plot, but now with planet radius on a log scale. Here's 100 Earth radii, 10 Earth radii, 5 Earth radii, 3, 2, and 1 Earth radius. And you're seeing a histogram, the number of candidate planets as a function of their radius. And you can see this dramatic rise toward lower and lower radius, or in other words, smaller and smaller planets. Just as we had seen with the Doppler survey that I told you about a minute ago. Same result, the Jupiters are fairly common, but there are more and more of the lower and lower mass planets. And you can see we have a problem here. Uh, we can't quite detect the Earths yet with Kepler. So this looks like a dearth. Is it real? Frankly, I don't know. This could be observational challenge. Technically, it's harder to find the Earths. Kepler is still struggling to uh, get enough measurements to find true Earths. Or it could be that nature makes fewer planets of one Earth radius. But whatever, this rise is, is quite uh, in align with and agrees with that previous plot. So the suggestion is that nature makes plenty of planets, in fact, observationally, planets of two uh, Earth radii are extremely common, and three Earth radii, very, very common. So that's news. We won't announce this result until February of next year. February 1st, uh, you'll see this graph uh, announced publicly. So this is exciting, and you can see already that the, the planets a little bigger than Earth are extremely are extremely common, even more so than in Jupiter's. So we can now go back to estimating how many uh, roughly Earth-sized planets there are. 200 billion stars in the Milky Way. The census of both Doppler and Kepler says that 15% have nearly Earth-sized planets. You can do the math, 15% of 200 billion is 30 billion Earth 
mass planets, roughly Earth mass planets. It's an estimate. It could be off by factors of two or three. But there are a lot of planets nearly the size of the Earth in our Milky Way galaxy, billions of them. And that, of course, leads to the question that um, biologists are interested in, how many of those Earths might be habitable? And indeed, what does it even mean for a planet to be habitable? What are the properties of a planet that render it uh, suitable for life? Well, nobody knows. Nobody knows what are the properties of a planet that make it definitively a world that might lead to, uh, to replicating molecules, DNA, or something like DNA, and single-celled uh, critters. So we have to start guessing. And the best way to guess about the properties that render a planet habitable is to go on the surface of the Earth to locations where the uh, conditions are the least hospitable for life and ask, does life get a toehold anyway, despite the harsh conditions? And one of the harshest conditions on the surface of the Earth is found, believe it or not, at our beloved national park, Yellowstone. Because in Yellowstone, the water comes out nearly boiling. In winter, Yellowstone is covered with frigid snow. So you've got boiling water and frozen water. And adding to the misery of Yellowstone, the water is highly acidic extremely acidic, and so you've got swings of temperature and acidity that you might think would not be conducive to life. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The hot springs are teeming with life, and you, these colors that you see coming out of the hot springs in the effluent represent different bacteria that thrive in the different temperature domains of the uh, effluent, and so the colors tell you immediately that there are different species of bacteria thriving in this very hot water coming out. You might want to verify the pH that the biologists have already measured. So when you go to Yellowstone next time, go to uh, Latimer Hall, go into one of the chemistry labs, steal some pH paper, and bring it to Yellowstone. I did this myself. <laughs> um, they don't know there in Latimer. And uh, you can dump the pH paper in the water. There you can measure it. It came out a pH of 2. So it's amazing that you can verify what the biologists study themselves. Highly acidic, and here in the background is beautiful filamentous bacteria growing in the hot, boiling water with this horrifying acidity of two. Uh, it's a marvelous example that life thrives despite harsh conditions. Uh, one of my favorite places in Yellowstone is called Grand Prismatic Spring. Look at this lovely lake. But look at all the colors. There's bacteria. You see the steam coming off of it. There's a, a volcanic rock in the foreground. This is a caldera that explodes every few hundred thousand years. And despite all of that, the bacteria are partying there in the Grand Prismatic Spring. And my favorite place is wow. Churning Cauldron. Look at the water. How could a, any species survive in that kind of hideous environment? I didn't dare uh, reach down <laughs> to churning cauldron with the pH paper, so I attached the pH paper to a black clip, and then I tied the black clip to a string, and then gingerly tossed the pH paper into churning cauldron. And here's and you can do this yourself, of course. And here's what I drew up. There's the pH paper. The pH came out too, highly acidic. This used to be a black metal clip. The corrosion is obvious because the water is so acidic. And as if to kind of laugh at our faces, you see the string? It used to be a white string. There's algae thriving in that churning cauldron, uh, despite the temperature, the boiling temperature, and the acidity. And so there, with your own hands, you can sense extremophiles, as they're called, that are clearly suited to live in these harsh conditions. And these extremophiles are sending us a message. It's an extra, uh, it's a galactic message, it's an it's a, it's a astrobiology message, even though they just live happily there in Yellowstone. And the message is these, these extremophiles that live and thrive in hot, acidic temperatures are telling us that on other Earth-like planets, as long as there's liquid water to serve as the solvent for biochemistry, uh, life should easily get a toehold and be able to thrive. So it's a marvelous, it's, a, it's frankly, I think this is a spiritual result. I mean, there aren't too many cases in astronomy uh, and physics where you, you, you know, the hairs stand up and you realize you're, you're touching something almost religious. Here you're seeing that life can thrive on other worlds. 
because in these bizarre conditions that are represented on the Earth, these little single-celled critters are telling us that life will have no trouble thriving on other Earth-like planets as long as there's liquid water. It's, it's, a, it's a, a spine-tingling result for me. So now I'd like to finish <laughs> with some cautionary notes. As a good scientist, I like to tell you when I, I'm usually, I'm probably right, and when I might be wrong. And so I, I sort of wanted to, to warn you the next five or 10 minutes, the last part of my talk, I'm going to wildly speculate. And I, I really could be wrong. Um, and here's the idea. What about intelligent life? And uh, we're, we're really privileged to have Charlie Towns here in the audience, who was one of the first people to try to search for signals of intelligent life elsewhere in our Milky Way galaxy and elsewhere. And I want to tell you sort of where we might stand on this issue currently. As I already said, there are some 30 billion planetary systems with perhaps Earths in them just within our Milky Way galaxy alone. What fraction of those 30 billion have intelligent life? Well, nobody knows. We have no idea if you start with an Earth-like planet and you plunk it out in uh, the galaxy somewhere around its host star, what's the chances that intelligent life will spring up as it has here on the Earth? We have no idea. The most pessimistic answer I've ever heard is that intelligent life only occurs on one in a million of the Earth-like planets. One in a million. Somehow intelligent life is just a real freak, a rarity, a quirk. If so, you can do the math, multiply one in a million by 30 billion, and you immediately see there are thousands, indeed tens of thousands, of civilizations. Many of them sprang up millions of years ago, so they're more advanced than we are. So their galaxy, even if life is one in a million, even if intelligent life is one in a million, our Milky Way galaxy should have thousands of advanced civilizations. Is that news, really? Well, not really, because of course the science fiction writers and the, the, the Star Wars directors and the Star Trek directors have been telling us this for a long time. The galaxy is teeming with intelligent life. Game over. Uh, watch out for the Romulans and the Klingons. <laughs> They're going to eat you for lunch. And uh, there are even some famous uh, physicists who think the aliens are going to come and eat us for lunch, if not breakfast. So this is the paradigm. We've grown up with Star Wars and Star Trek and now Avatar telling us that the galaxy is teeming with life. Is this right? Is our galaxy like this with thousands of civilizations? Well, I would like to argue the opposite. And you have to be honest in science and look at all the data. And there is more data. There are non-detections of intelligent life that offer an opposite perspective. For example, We've traveled to the moon. We've left equipment on the moon. We've left footsteps on the moon. No other advanced civilization ever came to the moon and left any indication that they've been there. There's no erosion on the moon, or very little, and yet there's only one set of footprints, literally and metaphorically, on the moon. What about Mars? We now have excellent images of the surface of Mars. And yet, while we have rovers on Mars, uh, robotic spacecraft orbiting Mars. No one of these thousands of advanced civilizations has deigned to visit Mars, put a, a camera or a seismometer or an orbiting robotic probe. It's, it's amazing. Mars offers a non-detection. The, the advanced civilizations haven't come there. And I think one of the greatest non-detections of advanced life is the Earth. We live on a Shangri-La here, this beautiful uh, planet with uh, tropical rainforests, beachfront property, and yet no aliens have come here and set up a resort hotel, you know, for their, their alien friends to come and take a vacation. The Earth has not, as far as we can tell, been uh, colonized uh, by, by aliens. And so, despite four billion years, and frankly two billion years of the Earth being a lovely uh, oasis in the galaxy, Yet, we haven't attracted the attention, somehow, of these thousands of advanced civilizations out there. It's surprising, right? We humans have traveled over the surface of the Earth, colonizing every continent and, and island. But on a galactic scale, the supposed uh, advanced species haven't done so. Moreover, telescopes at all wavelengths are scanning the night sky every night, professional telescopes. We've never had a good image of a, of a UFO or an alien spacecraft. Why not? 
It's a little surprising. The night sky shows no gamma rays from the, the matter-antimatter engines of the Starship Enterprise and its ilk. It's a little surprising we haven't seen evidence of these advanced spacecraft. Moreover, there are no robotic probes we know of in the solar system, none. With a galaxy teeming with life, not one of them sent a little uh, camera to orbit the Earth. And moreover, uh, as Charlie was one of the leaders in this, we have not yet found radio signals from advanced civilization. So we shouldn't fail to take into account these non-detections. It's a sobering reality about the prospects of advanced civilizations in our galaxy. And I know Charlie has to go. So whenever you need to go, don't, don't let me stop you. I'm sorry to miss the rest of it. That's OK. Great job. Good Great to see you, Charlie. So um, what does this all mean? Have we blown it? Have we overestimated the probability of intelligent life in the galaxy? They should have wandered here by luck. <laughs> so maybe we made a mistake. And I'd like to finish my talk by telling you how we might be wrong. How the idea that the galaxy is teeming with life might be, albeit pes pessimistic, albeit sort of uh, a depressing possible conclusion, still might be wrong. One possibility is that most Earths don't have the right amount of water. The Earth has a thin veneer of water, it's an ocean on our planet Earth, that allows the continents to pop up above sea level. But the Earth has only 0.03% of water. 0.03%. If the Earth had more water uh, that was uh, brought here by asteroids and comets that deliver water, uh, if there were more water, uh, we'd be in a water world. The Earth would be covered by water with no continents. If there were less water, the Earth would be a desert. The Earth has just the right amount of water to allow there to be continents so that we can have physics 111 labs and allow people to build electronic circuits. We couldn't build electric circuits, never mind violins, pianos, and spaceships, if we lived in a water world or a desert world. Technology as we know it really wouldn't be possible. So maybe, just to back up, maybe most, most Earth-like planets are covered by water or have no water on the surface at all, making intelligent life much, much more difficult than it was even here on the Earth. That's one possibility as to why intelligent life might be rare. Here's another one. This one's even more poignant. We humans like to think that we reside at the pinnacle of Darwinian evolution. We're the best. We're the greatest you know, end product of Darwinian evolution. Well, if that were really true, species would always be getting smarter and smarter as they evolve. It turns out not to be true. Species of all sorts stay with just about the same amount of intelligence that they had at, the, at their dawn. And the best example of this lack of evolution of brain power comes from the greatest species that ever walked the earth, the dinosaurs. A hundred million years of dinosaur evolution. Each mother dinosaur laying an egg, hoping that their little baby dinosaur would have a, would have a high IQ and be smarter than all the other, and would therefore be able to outcompete the other dinosaurs. And then that smart dinosaur would, would survive and lay eggs and, and give rise to smarter and smarter dinosaurs. Didn't happen. 100 million years, the brain sizes of dinosaurs are no bigger than those of chicken brains, uh, and, and indeed dinosaurs were no smarter than chickens. 100 million years, the last of the dinosaurs were no smarter, had no larger cranium than a paleontological record shows. Their brain uh, cranium size was no greater than the original dinosaurs. Being smart doesn't help. It's amazing. It's hard to believe. It, it seems like it helps us in our physics classes, but it didn't help the dinosaurs. I guess they didn't have too many physics classes. So it's not true that we humans you know, are so great as a species. Other species survive perfectly well with a hard shell, like the cockroaches. They ain't given up their hard shells to just be a little better at playing the violin. Uh, and long necks like the giraffe, uh, birds that fly, they have attributes that allow them to survive without extra brain power. Brains are just one of thousands of ways you can survive. And in fact, 
Um, even modern day species are not getting smarter, like insects. Insects aren't getting smarter at all. And mammals, like cats and dogs. Cats and dogs aren't getting smarter with the eons. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you know, they'd be playing uh, Chopin or Chopsticks or something. So there, there's, if you talk to evolutionary biologists, they will tell you that we humans are not at the pinnacle of Darwinian evolution. We're some little twig instead, and that other species aren't getting smarter. So maybe other Earth-like planets spring up, spawn life, but the life forms don't necessarily ever have these large, brainy craniums that we have, that there's life out there, just not intelligent life. And in fact, there are some species on the Earth that have no brains at all, and they survive perfectly well. And here's one example. When you are smart, you eventually learn to build weapons. Biological, chemical, nuclear, and other kinds of environmental problems accrue when you have a big brain. Maybe advanced species do spring up in the Milky Way galaxy. They might even travel a little distance, but they eventually uh, kill themselves off. And we humans obviously are at least somewhat vulnerable year after year, century after century, to making a, mi a mistake, a big mistake. And so how many hundreds or thousands of years will we humans last every few years going through some concern about our great political apocalypse? So maybe being big-brained is part of our problem, uh, not so much a big help. So I'll just finish by saying one of the exciting activities is indeed to search for intelligent life. We need big radio telescopes to hunt for the radio and television signals. Uh, we, we know where to point these radio telescopes. You point at the, the Earth-like planets that we're beginning to find. So I think a great quest for the next century is to build larger radio telescopes and find out if advanced intelligent life is or is not common in our Milky Way galaxy. We won't know if we don't look. And so um, I'll just finish then with these conclusions. Planets are obviously common in our galaxy. Uh, Kepler is going to find Earth-like planets, as you can already tell. Uh, we're getting early signs. Intelligence is not the, the uh, natural end product of Darwinian evolution. Uh, primitive life, of course, should be common. There's plenty of water, and the extremophiles tell us that a primitive life can survive without any trouble. But it's intelligent life that I think is the $64 million question. Technological life that requires continents and oceans uh, and other conditions to, to uh, thrive. And so it's conceivable, even though Star Trek and Star Wars taught us differently, it's conceivable that technological life is actually rare uh, in the galaxy. We humans may be one of only a handful of technological civilizations in our Milky Way. We might even be the only one. It's very hard to know. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Some of them are rocky, very pure rock. Um, this is news that hasn't been made public yet. Some of them have huge uh, bodies of water on them from their densities, like that Kepler-4. We can measure the density. Some of them come out with a density of about 2 grams per cc. Rock plus water, maybe some hydrogen helium as well. So we're seeing two types of small planets, the rocky ones and those that have volatile uh, material like water and gases. So Kepler cannot find planets that orbit so longer than 
Yes. So the duration of Kepler. Is it right. like said then bias bias against like long good class? Sure, yeah. Kepler with its three and a half year lifetime, if you demand that you see three transits, Kepler will only see three one year orbit transits. And so planets that orbit even farther from their stars uh, that take five years or ten years, Kepler won't see those. Yeah. So, so We're actually trying for an extended mission. So one of the things that I'll be de dedicating my life to in the next year is to write a proposal to NASA headquarters pleading with them to send money to the Kepler team so that we can continue to take data for three more years. That will give us a total of six or six and a half years. So doesn't that make that planet histogram that you, you showed us a little suspect because there's a bias against the larger planets maybe further out? Let me spin it a different way in the, <laughs> in, in the, in the vein of um, the, the current political system. Uh, and I do mean this seriously. It's not a bias. What it is formally is that we can detect planets that orbit close in, we know what their orbital periods are, and we can't detect planets that orbit far out. So the statistics that you see pertain, without bias, to the close-in planets. So it's unbiased for close-in, and we're ignorant of the nature of planets outward of about two Earth-Sun distances. Two so so is it still fair to say that nature prefers smaller planets if we don't? Only among the close-in ones. The farther out ones, we have no idea. You're, you're absolutely right. You're both making the same point. Yeah, so it's conceivable that, uh, you know, uh, farther out from a star, uh, the Earths don't dominate, and instead it's the Jupiters and the Saturns that are more common possible. Yeah? Um, how do you draw the pictures, like the composition of planets, just given their density? Like, how do you... So that's a very good question. How do we, and let me just back up and ask your question my way, because it's such a good question. How do we know that the iron and the nickel is at the center? and the silicate is outside that, and then the water, and then the hydrogen helium. And the answer, I could give you several, I could give you a whole hour long talk, it's a really exciting question. But the quick answer is, if you take material from the universe, and you build a planet, and then you just let it go and naturally evolve, the heavy material will sink to the center, iron and nickel, and uranium and you know, other heavier elements. The next heaviest material are the silicates, the rocks. So they kind of, if you will, float on the heavy iron and nickel. And then the water, being lighter still, floats on the silicates. And then finally, the lightest material of all is this hydrogen helium. So it's a little bit like taking a cup of water and adding oil. You know that no matter how much you, you stir it up initially, eventually the oil will come and float on the top. And so these um, layered uh, structures for planets, like our Earth is the same thing, is uh, a result, it's called differentiation. It's a result of the lighter material floating buoyantly on the heavier material. But, the, the, you know, there's another angle on this question, which is how do you know a planet should have water at all? And indeed, you could imagine constructing a hypothetical planet with just iron nickel, silicate rocks, no water, and just hydrogen and helium. And you could build such a planet, and it would satisfy the density and mass that we have observed. Yeah? How would you distinguish an Earth from a Venus? You, we can't. We have no, we'd have no way. And indeed, Earth and Venus are, are twin planets, except for the fact that Venus is a, is a hideous hellhole. <laughs> Other than that, you know, it's a 450 degrees Celsius on the surface of Venus, because the, the greenhouse effect has run away there, and we're hoping that doesn't happen here. But Venus has a mass and a radius essentially identical to, and a chemical composition essentially identical to that of the Earth. So Venus's and Earth's will be indistinguishable. So are there any proposals for methods of figuring out how to distinguish between them? Um, well, yes, but it's hard. So here's what you need to do. You need to actually build a telescope in space, a huge one, the size of a football field, image those planets, and by measuring the infrared radiation, the thermal radiation, you could then infer the temperature of the planet. Venus being so hot will have enormous thermal radiation. You'll pick that up, you'll know that the, the heat 
uh, for whatever reason, the greenhouse effect has run away. So you need infrared data, <coughs> which we currently don't have, to determine the actual temperatures and thereby infer something about the atmospheres and the greenhouse effects on those planets. Yeah. Well, why was that particular area of the sky chosen? Ah, so why Cygnus? And the answer is we knew we needed at least 150,000 stars to get good statistics on the planets. And by the way, I cheated a little bit. I forgot to mention that for a planet to transit, here's your star. For a planet to transit, it has to be aligned perfectly with your line of sight, or it won't transit. If the orbit is like this, or like that, you know, or any of the, the funny angles of, of tilt, you won't see uh, a transiting planet. So we needed 150,000 stars because we knew it was about a 1 in 100 shot that a planet has got its orbital plane so lined up. So to answer the question, Cygnus happens to lie in the plane of our Milky Way galaxy, where, as you saw in the picture, the density of stars is very, very high. And that packs a lot of stars into our Kepler field of view, the 10 degree field of view. So the galactic plane is a, is a great hunting ground uh, for planets because there are just so many stars there. Um, does Kepler selectively choose stars to look at? Because it seems like that's a lot of information yeah. to take in and store. It's a huge amount of information. And what happened with Kepler was five years prior to launch, some of the Kepler team members took pictures of the Cygnus constellation and cataloged all of the stars. In fact, six million stars. And of the six million stars, 150,000 were selected as the ones that Kepler would search for planets, basically the brightest, uh, the most bright stars in that region. So there was this um, early reconnaissance work, you might say, to identify the targets. In fact, it's called the Kepler Input Catalog, KIC, we call it. And so every star that we observe has a KIC number, a Kepler Input Catalog number, that we establish way before launch. Yeah. Um, so the Kepler mission uses eclipsing to visit these uh, uh, planets? Yeah, we call it transiting. Right. Or transiting. Yeah. But there are other methods, as far as I know, such as uh, interferometric method measurements or occultation uh, methods. Is there any advantage over Kepler for those methods or because it's biased towards the orientation of the yeah. orbit plane? Well, long story short, the Kepler is the best thing going by a long ways. We are using the Keck telescope in Hawaii and we're, as you saw, we're finding smaller and smaller planets. We're not going to beat Kepler. I'm sure we won't. Kepler's too good. And there are some people looking for gravitational microlensing to detect planets. Some people are trying to take pictures of those planets directly, take a really good quality picture with a coronagraphic camera, and maybe you can see the little dot of light that's the reflected light off of a planet nearby this the glare of the host star. Very hard to do. So Kepler is just way by far the best technique uh, to, to find the small planets. So are there any uh, uh, missions that are moving into sort of the stage of actual uh, launch or design no, no. to succeed in no. the other is it? No. Isn't that heartbreaking? <laughs> it's I'm heartbreaking. <laughs> no, I mean right now uh, NASA doesn't have any proposed missions to follow up uh, with Kepler. So it's uh, you know it's it's, there, we're entering a period where Kepler will remain vibrant, but we don't have a new generation. There is a proposed telescope in space that would measure this thermal emission that we were talking about. Uh, that's called the Terrestrial Planet Finder, TPF. But we don't have any funding for it. It will cost over a billion dollars. And uh, in these budgetary economic times, you know, there's no money for, for such a telescope. But I think in a few years when the economy improves, then this terrestrial planet finder will come back. Many, many scientists are already designing it and advocating on behalf of it. So, you know, 10 years from now, maybe we'll have a spaceborne telescope that can take pictures of these Earths. Now, who did you say that the Kepler mission is going to actually be collecting data? So, nominally, it's three and a half year mission. <coughs> yeah, which is not, which is a special number because our Earth takes one year. So three and a half years allows you to see three orbits of an Earth, a true Earth. 
And that's why we're hoping for an extension. We'd like another three years to do a better job. Yeah, um, are there any reliable methods to verify the planetary composition model? Um, yeah, there might be one. When these Earths cross in front of the star, some of the starlight passes through the atmosphere of the planet and goes on its way to the Earth. You can take a spectrum of the star, and you might see extra absorption due to the planet. And you might be able to detect methane or carbon dioxide or water vapor in the atmosphere of the planet as the starlight passes through that atmosphere. That won't probably happen until about 2015, when NASA launches a new spaceborne telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST for short. And so we need this big telescope to take those spectra. So we might get chemical information about the, the composition of planets from, from that new telescope. Yeah. In the initial data that you showed us, um, the dips are different heights. Is that just a sampling phenomenon? It no is. Yeah, that's a very good good eyeball. I noticed it too. Some of the drops were deeper than others. And and it's sampling. I'll tell you, I, I didn't actually uh, tell you. You don't see it in the face folded one, so it's pretty clear. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a sampling issue. But I'll tell you why it's a sampling issue. I didn't actually mention this. Um, I said that Kepler takes a picture every one minute. Actually, what it does is it co-adds those pictures 30 frames. So actually, what's stored on the Kepler spacecraft are pictures that are co-add of 30-minute long exposures, 30 one-minute exposures. So there is a sampling issue as the planet crosses in front of the star. Essentially, we're only getting a measure of the brightness of the star every 30 minutes. And so if you hit it just right, you get the deepest transit possible. But if you hit it off phase, it, it doesn't look quite as deep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you said you wanted to um, extend the lifetime of Kepler? Yeah. Three um, years. I'm guessing there is a point where um, the Earths they were trying to find are so far away from the, exactly. uh, from the star that there is no point to extend it anymore. What is that limit of the year? Well, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go that far because <laughs> it might well be that there are Earths that orbit their star farther and farther and farther away. So the longer you extend the Kepler mission, the f it's essentially like enlarging your field of view as you extend to five years, 10 years, 20 years. You're simply going to detect planets that take longer and longer and longer to orbit their star. And there could well be Earths out there, and if not, that would be interesting too. No Earths farther than some distance. That would be exciting. Okay, so, so my question, I guess, was um, if you have an Earth sized planet, if it is closer to a star, yeah. it would blow more light if it is far away? No, it, it doesn't. It will be the same. It, yeah, it's the same. And the reason is, these stars are, are thousands of, you know, they're trillions of miles away. They're so far that whether the planet is this far away or that far away, it, the projected area is the same. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh -huh. um, I was just wondering if any of these targets, uh, or all of the targets, are just a, pair, a single parent star of the planet? Or do you have any, for instance, binary systems, binary star systems, or possible? Or is that um, you know, that is a really good question. I don't know the answer to it. And I'll tell you why I don't know the answer to it. Um, binary stars are very common, and they might be separated by, say, 50 Earth sun distances. And the question is, how would we know? You know, how would we know if a star were a binary star? Suppose you have a star, a sunlight star, a planet is going around it, and there's another star nearby, but it's fainter. How would we know? They're, they're, they're 50 Earth-Sun distances apart, but at, you know, a uh, thousand light years away, which is how far they are, we would only see one dot of light. So some of these stars might be binaries and we wouldn't even know it. And you wouldn't see that in the top of the we would, if we wait long enough, we would right. see the Doppler, because it might take a thousand years for these two stars to slowly orbit each other. So if we make Doppler measurements over the next thousand years, you know, then, uh, so, a long time.
Yeah. Uh, I'm more of a SETI type topic. Yeah. Uh, re recently, they announced the discovery of the planet Gliese 581G. Yeah. Which is a few times larger than the Earth, and it orbits right. in the habitable zone. Right. Uh, are there any? I'm sure there are, but like, well, what's the status of any proposals to, like, send a basically send a hey, we're over here message? <laughs> um, I don't know. I haven't heard of any pro proposal to do that, so I, I haven't heard anything. Oh. I, I say I, I know somebody's got to be thinking it. I'm just yeah, I just haven't heard right. of anything. Yeah, somebody might want to try that. <laughs> Should we quit for the day?